I was being nice to you, Ty. All right, everybody. Let's get started here. Now, <coughs> we uh, have been going through the book of First Peter, but we just ended chapter two. So guess what we're going to do today? Chapter do something three. different. Do something yeah. different. That's right. Oh, do something wrong. Chapter yeah. one. Which is typical a lot of times of what we'll do is we'll pause. But today, um, we, uh, we're, we're going to do something that it has actually kind of come up, um, and, and so this is not something new. This is something actually we did uh, a while ago, probably a couple years ago now. But it's good to do this, what we're about to do, uh, every once in a while, maybe once a year even, just to kind of pull this out, stare at it, think it through, like God really you know, needed in our hearts. And that is this, um, especially when we're doing all that we're doing right now, praise God, to reach out to our communities and to our neighbors and uh, people that are in our lives, um, there's a lot of spiritual talk <coughs> that goes on. And one of the key questions that must be asked and must be answered is, well, how do I know that I'm really right with God? Because there's a lot of takes on that. There's a lot of religions, a lot of denominations. Even within the, the you know, Christianity, the, the realm of Christianity, there's a lot of take on, uh, different takes on, well, how do I get you know, right with God? And, uh, and, and for even for our own church body, this is very relevant. So, that's what we're going to talk about today. And what I've given you is a worksheet where, uh, for that answer, to answer that question, you know, how do I know the Lord with God, it is not very wise um, to go to our own opinions. Not a very smart thing for humans to do to trust humans. Okay? Because the, the fact is that we uh, are fallen. And we're going to go to our experiences, we're going to go to our wants and needs, and we're not necessarily going to go to the answer to that question, or any question for that matter, uh, based on what is actually true. We're going to go with our feelings. <coughs> and we need to answer questions like this according to truth. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your truth, right? So we're going to go to the scriptures. And this is not going to be like we normally do, where we have a, a passage in front of us that we're going to go through verse by verse. There's going to be a lot of different uh, passages and verses today. By the way, on the back, which you're not supposed to look at, remember, <laughs> Jerry, I'm watching you. Um, on the back, all these things we're going to list, ha I have verses, and I listed the verses out for you. Okay, so you'll have them. Okay, yeah, I know, I'm very nice. Um, but the first thing we're going to start with is, is this. I want to just say this before we pray and dive in. This is a question that's asked a lot, and I think there's a debate as to should we have an answer. There's actually people who would say, you know, it's not necessary that we know the answer to the question if we're right with God. The problem with that is, is that it's absolutely the heart of God that we do know. God wants us to know. Look at these verses here. I did put these in the front. Look, at, listen to this. 2 Peter 1.10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to conform, or I'm sorry, to confirm, and that word confirm means to make firm, make strong, make unshakable your calling and your election. So he wants us to live lives where we're, we're not just... You know, going back and forth, well, am I right with God, am I not right with God? He wants our lives to be unshaken and steadfast by the fact that we know God, that we are saved. First John 5, 3, these things I've written to you so that you will believe in the name of the Son of God and that you will know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want us walking around wondering, oh, do I have eternal life or do I not? And that, that kind of life, by the way, when you're going back and forth between do I, don't I, that's misery. For the believer, that's misery. So he wants us to know all the things written in that letter, he says. And then there's other things, like first, uh, uh, I'm sorry, like uh, John 10, uh, 27 to 29. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give life, eternal life to them. They will never perish, and nobody's going to snatch them out of my hand. In fact, he says, my Father who's given to me, greater than everybody, no one's going to snatch them out of his hand either. And then Romans 8, 38, 39. For I'm convinced that this that neither life, uh, death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You get the sense that God wants us to absolutely rest in the salvation He's given us and the love that came, that came from Him. Amen? Amen? So, how do we know? Well, let's pray first and then we'll dive in. Father... Um, before we get to the, the subject at hand, we just want to call upon your name this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask you that you would fill this pulpit 
and you would fill um, this room, you would fill our hearts, that you would do what only you can do, and that is you would convince us of that which is true. You would disciple us this morning, God. Teach us this morning from your word. We're going to come with our humanity. We're going to come with our questions. We're going to come with our frailties and our weaknesses. But, Lord, we come to your throne today to sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, to hear from you. And you're going to speak to us by the power of your spirit and through the truth of your word. And, God, I pray that as we go through these things, Lord, we're not just going through them for the sake of going through them, but these will impact us for the world that we live in, for the life that we lead for you and your glory, God. We want to be equipped so that when we're out on the planet Earth and we're walking around this darkness, God, that light would shine from our hearts. And that today, God, that today would be another time that we get to learn and then we get to live it. Not just to, just to, to see it and hear it, but to live it, to do it, Lord. All for your glory. So please teach us this morning. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay. So we're going to start with things that don't necessarily prove or disprove faith. Now, there's things that don't necessarily, and then things according to God's Word that do. We're going to start with a list of, of, here's the things that you might hear when you ask, people ask the question, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you're right with God? However that question comes. And you might hear these, these six things. Okay, you might hear somebody say this or that. But they might not be proof. Okay? So let's get to those first. And then we're going to get to the things that these are absolutely, according to God's word, things that do prove that you are in, in Christ. So um, here's number one. High moral standards. So on your sheet there, <coughs> top of the list, write in high moral standards. Now I'm just going to say this. Morality being a good person, being moral, being good, morality does not always equate to Christianity. I'm going to say it again. <coughs> morality does not always equate to genuine Christianity. Um, guys, there are a lot of moral people in this planet that are not saved. Think about people you know. Think about people you live by. Good people. People that will give the shirt off their back for you. People that, you know, they, they're just, especially here in this, our, you know, our country in America, they are people that pride themselves on being a good American and paying their taxes and, and, and just being good. Being good humans. Um, that does not necessarily make them followers of Christ. In fact, wouldn't you say a lot of people you meet that are good, there's a lot of those people that don't even know, you know, don't even believe that there's a God. Or to say, well, I'm not sure there's a God or whatever. But they're good people. Well, um, being a good person and you're in is not reality. There are also very religious people. We'll get to that in just, just a second. But we, if, we're, if we're relying on any kind of external good, then we're relying on the wrong thing. And there's the thing. Uh, the, the problem with being good and counting on that, um, Jesus over and over again in the Gospels would approach somebody or somebody would approach him, and they're trying to you know give their resume to him. Look, look how good I am, God. Look at that. See, these are my list of good and bad, and, but the bad's really small compared to my good, right? So, so I'm good, right? And what Jesus was trying to do is go, look, toss that aside. Put your resume away. Put your good moral morality away. Because what I'm trying to show you is, no matter how good you are in this world, and no matter, how, uh, no matter how good you are compared to other humans, nobody's good enough to get to heaven by their own works. So external morality, that's no proof. Number two, intellectual knowledge. So again, we're, what, we're, what we're doing here is we're listing out things that are not necessarily proof that you're saved, right? that you're right with God. Morality, but also knowledge. Um, you can know a lot about God. You can know a lot about Jesus. You can know a lot of facts about you know stories about who Jesus is. You can know actually all of the the tenets of the gospel. You can say, "Yep, Jesus well, died on the cross, and uh, he died for my sin, and then he rose again three days later, and uh, and he's coming back." You can know all the stats, like you know you know your favorite 
player on, a, on the back of a football card. You've got all the stats there. That does not mean necessarily that you truly know Jesus. You can know about him, but still not know him. Uh, I actually know people, or uh, of people, who know and have shared the gospel to people before and, and are not saved themselves. Like shared the gospel with people. People coming to Christ through their words and they themselves walk away. In fact, there's, there's a, a famous author, I won't mention his name, but somebody that will shock you, I just found out. He wrote a book many years ago, he was a pastor, and he just renounced his faith. Wow. So intellectual knowledge does not translate into salvation necessarily. Okay. Number three, religious or church involvement. I hear this. I've asked. Well, how do you know that you're right with God? How do you know if you die tomorrow that you'd, you'd go to heaven? Well, I've gone to church all my life. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been a deacon. Or I've, I've, you know, somehow there's this answer, well, I've, I'm, I'm involved with, you know, the church thing. Religious. I'm religious. Great. So are the Pharisees. I mean, were there any more religious people than the, relig the, the religious people who killed Jesus? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes? Just because you go to church, guys, and remember the old saying? Being inside the church building doesn't make you a Christian anymore that standing in a garage makes you a car, right? right. It just doesn't work that way. So, um, by the way, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 says that we can have a form of godliness that is powerless. We can be religious and it completely be devoid of power because it's not real. It's not true. It's not what Jesus has laid out for us as this right here is the true religion. The true way to God through himself. Number four, very similar to that one, is active ministry. Okay, so number three is attendance, right? Being a part of a church service or religious involvement. But number four is a step further saying, well, I mean, I've been involved in ministry. So number four, active ministry. That does not necessarily mean that you're in Christ and you're right with God. I mean, there, look, there are plenty of pastors that graduate seminary or not, but they're pastors, and they're not saved. People that are, you know, charged with discipling and teaching God's people, and then they don't know God themselves. Uh, there are people who are involved in youth groups and singles groups and um, outreach and building houses and all these things that they have not been changed in their hearts. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Listen to these scary words. Jesus is referring to that day of judgment. And he, uh, he says, there's going to be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I perform miracles in your name? And Jesus, and by the way, those are all ministry kinds of things, aren't they? Mm -hmm. right? And Jesus said this, I will say to them, depart from me, Apart from me, I never knew you. Guys, that, we're getting closer now to there's a difference between somebody being somebody you've heard of and somebody you know intimately, personally. Active ministry can be done in our flesh, just like anything else. Number five, a time of decision. A time of decision. <clears throat> this one is big for parents. I've heard... Um, you know, Sue has a son, and the son is just living off the charts, you know, just, just diving into sin. And I talked to Sue, and I'm, not, I'm just using names, by the way, that aren't <coughs> just, you know, that, okay. Um, I talked to Sue, and Sue says, oh no, my son, Johnny, he's fine, he's great with the Lord. Why is that? Well, because back in youth camp, when he was young, he prayed a prayer. So we're counting on the, this moment. This, uh, I, felt, I felt close because the music was this, and I saw something, and I prayed this prayer. We're counting on that and that alone, even though there's a life that has no fruit of Christ, and it's, there's, just, there's no obedience, and there's no uh, one to live for, for the glory of God. It doesn't match <coughs> up. First um, John, uh, it's, a, it's a letter, by the way. It's a wonderful letter about proving you're, you are not saved. And he says this, in 1 John 1, 6, it says, We are lying if we have 
uh, who say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living in spiritual darkness. We're lying. We say, I'm in Christ, I'm good, and yet our lives are in spiritual darkness. We're lying, he says. We're lying to ourselves. We're lying to our kids when we give them that assurance. Oh, no, no, you, you're okay, you prayed the prayer. You walked the aisle. How many people have gone to Billy Graham uh, and Franklin Graham you know, concerts and stadiums? Have gone down the aisle to share the gospel. Everybody wants to sit, you know, receive Christ. So they've gone down, walked down there. How many of those people are counting on that moment for their salvation? We can't count on that, guys. It, yes, a time of decision and praying the sinner's prayer absolutely could mean you're in Christ. <coughs> but it, it's not something that's proof of salvation. And then lastly, last one on this list, guilt. Specifically, guilt over your sin. Regret. The scriptures talk about, in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 10, they talk about a difference between worldly sadness or worldly guilt versus godly sorrow. And so the fact that it does that, it's, there's a separation. The, the worldly guilt, guys, that, that's, I think a lot of people, I, I think it's fair to say everybody feels bad about things they've said, things they've done, things they didn't say, things they didn't do. We all have regret. This, full, this world is full of people with guilt and regret. Um, now, by the way, the world tries to answer that by saying, no, 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 let's eliminate your responsibility. It's not your fault. You're the victim. You're not responsible for who you are, what you do. But even when the world tries to sell that bill of goods, all of us know that's a lie. Because we all have guilt over things we've you know, said, done, and so forth. Um, it almost feels spiritual to hold on to that guilt. Like we're doing God as a service by holding on to it. I feel bad about this, and I'm going to hold on to my. I'm going to punish myself. You guys okay over there? Okay. Um, but guys, I'm telling you, guilt by itself, if you just hold on to guilt, that's going to lead you right to eternal darkness. God wants us to do something with the guilt. Hey, sweetheart, there's, we're not open to the coffee shop. We're doing, we're doing a church service. Oh, I'm so That's okay. Sorry. You can come in and join us if you want. Oh, actually, I work right across the street, oh, so I'm okay. a little bit late. Okay. okay, you bet. Have a good day. You too. Um, so the guilt we have, we're supposed to do something with it. Okay? That's, that's the point. And there's, let me just say, as we close this one out, there's a difference between reformation and regeneration. We can be reformed, quote unquote, from our guilt. We can go to psychologists and psychiatrists and talk to them about how we're guilty about this and they can talk us out of that and encourage us and whatever. And we can be uh, reformed. But there's a, that's not the same as being regenerated, transformed. We can be reformed without being transformed. Okay? So those are the six things that they could or couldn't prove. But what about absolute certainty that, yes, I am right with God. Here's what the scripture says about that. Now, there's ten of these things. I'm going to spend most of my time here on the first four and then sort of zip by the last six, okay? So hang in there. Um, well, let's get to them. And, and this, this one on the top of the list, guys, it's, it, is, it has to go on the top of the list, okay? How do I know that I'm right with God? You ready? Number one, the Holy Spirit. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I am grateful to Jesus every single day of my life that He did not leave me to walk this earth on my own. Isn't it great of God that when He said, I will rescue you from your sin, I'm not just going to stay in heaven and watch you fumble around and try to work it out by yourself. No. I'm going to give you God. I'm going to give you me. And He's going to live. I'm going to live in your soul. Jesus is going to reside in your heart. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you and guide you and convict you and encourage you and walk with you and direct your path every single day. Listen to these verses. 1 John 4, 13 through 15. Listen to this. God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. 
Furthermore, we have seen with our eyes, our own eyes, and now we testify that the Father sent His Son to, the, to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God has God living in them, and they live in God. So we're saying, well, how do I know that I'm right with God? Well, listen, is there this something inside you that it won't go away, and that is, I know that I know that I know that Jesus is the Son of God, and He came to rescue me from my sin. I'm going to call upon His name, period. He is the answer. And there's something inside you that won't let go of that. I know that I know that I know that Jesus came to this planet Earth to die for my sin on that cross. And everything I've done wrong, all that guilt I have, He took it and it's finished. I know who Jesus is. There's somebody... See, that's not knowledge we come to on our, our own, guys. Guess who's telling us that all the time? The Spirit of God who lives in our hearts. Listen to this. Romans 8, 13-16. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. And that means you're going to stay in your trespass, dead in your trespasses. But, if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. And we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself testify with your spirit that you are a child of God. Amen. Amen. Guys, these, these passages are telling us that we have a witness, a living witness inside of us that's always bearing witness with our spirit telling us yes you are yes you are and in those moments that we doubt our faith and we're questioning there's always a voice inside of us saying no I, I belong to him I'm his it's hard to explain that isn't it it's hard to, to get that out in the words it, because it's such a divine divinely powerful thing that happens when you've given your life to Christ and He's forgiven you for your sins. He's wiped you clean. Now you have the Spirit inside of you, constantly telling you, reminding you who you belong to. I think we doubt our salvation most when we're giving ourselves over to sin. And it's not just in sinful activity. It's even like knowing that God's will is this, but we keep walking away from God's will. I think that's when we're most susceptible to not hearing the Spirit's voice. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Yeah. Right? So, so our job, of course, is to what? Is to surrender. And guys, the more we surrender, the more that we humbly bow, the more we're going to hear that precious voice of the Spirit of God. Yes, you belong to me. That's number one. Number two. How do I know I'm right with God? Because you love Jesus. Love for Jesus. You know, when Jesus was asked a similar question, uh, uh, somebody came up to him and said, how do I know uh, what the greatest commandment of the law is? Because you know, you've got all these commandments, and uh, you know, we're taught all these things by the rabbis. And, and it's kind of the same question, right? It's because to, to this young per the Jewish person who was asking, the law is what they equate with being right with God. So he's asking, but all this stuff that God says to do and not do, what's the one that I know that is the best, that could be right with God? That, it's a similar question he was asking. And here's how Jesus answered. Um, and this is in Matthew 22, 36. His answer is, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Interesting that Jesus' answer had nothing to do with doing, had everything to do with something that was going on between the heart and God. Loving God with everything you've got. I, I know that love, by the way, is hard sometimes to describe and to measure. So let me just do this. I want you to do this. Sitting there in your couch, chair, <coughs> love seat, whatever it is. Think about the person that you care about the most right now. Think about them. How do you know you love them? Or her. How do you know? The person you care about the most on this planet, how do you know that you love them or her? You know what? I, I, uh, when I think of that person, she's sitting somewhere in this vicinity, somewhere in this area right here. Her happiness means more to me. 
to anything. I, I want her to be more happy than I am. I would sacrifice anything for that woman. Anything. This person is my joy. She is my prize. And I would sacrifice whatever it took for her well-being. Right? That's how I know. Guys, as much as I love this woman here, I'm supposed to love God supremely. Because I love God supremely, now I can love her the way I want. How do you know you love God? Do, does His name and His glory and His holiness and His reputation and His kingdom, do those things mean everything to you? Do, when you hear the lies about God, does it do something inside you? Mm -hmm. Make you a little upset? Righteously? Right? No, no, no. You're lying. Is that, do you feel that? Do you want to do everything you've got to do, even if it meant sacrificing your life. If someone's going to tell me you either renounce Christ or die, I'll take the bullet every time. Why? Do religious people do that? Do people who have a religion, and that's how they relate to God, is that how they feel? That's different. Because I guarantee you guys, when it's all said and done, if somebody is just religiously related to God, when the bullet is threatened, when their life is threatened, right, are they going to say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm in. I don't see how they can. I think many a person has renounced their faith because their, their own life is threatened. Look, being in Christ means when my life is threatened and, and it's because I, uh, of, of Jesus, take my life. Take it. But I'm never giving up on Him. That is love. That is love. So when you're asking yourself the question, am I right with God? Ask yourself, do I love Him? Do I love Him? Here's the third one. And this is attached to that one. Love for others. Particularly your brothers and sisters. Do you have love for others? When Jesus answered that question, by the way, the question was, how do I know I'm right with God? You know, how all these commandments. And He said, okay, love the Lord God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number one, he said, oh, by the way, the second one, second grade is just like it. It's, it's inextricably attached to it. And that was, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, 1 John 4, 10 through 12. Listen to this. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So let's talk about the gospel, the sacrifice of Christ. Listen to this. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. The gospel was never meant to be this one-sided religious thing where he did everything for us and we have no responsibility on our own. In response. Here's the thing. Jesus did it for the human race, particularly for him, he, those that he chose before the foundation of the world. And those he chose, and those who walk by his power and in his name, we are called now to do the same thing. We don't hang on a cross literally, but guys, we carry our cross every day. And that cross means that we are to sacrificially love one another. You want to know if you're right with Christ? Ask yourself the question. Do you love others? Even people who've hurt you. Do you want their best? Do you pray for them? Uh, is, is their well-being important to you? Not that you walk perfectly in this. Okay, that, that's, that's not the issue here. Because there's going to be certain people that are harder to love than others. But in the end, we know that we love Him and we're right with Him because we're first, we love Him, but we also have care and well-being, particularly <coughs> for people who <coughs> are brothers and sisters. Particularly for the body. Particularly for other believers. Right? Um... No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and His love is brought to full expression in us. That's the proof. We love, if we love each other, God lives in us. And then in uh, that verse 16 of that same passage, it says, God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Number four. We talked about guilt from sin, right? The last one on the, the first list. Well, that's not a proof. Here it is. Repentance. Repentance from your sin. That's the proof. Hear me on this, guys. 
just holding on to guilt is not, it may feel spiritual, but it's not. It's just humanity. Okay, it's how we're wired. Guilt is something we all deal with, and we got to do something with it. So just holding on to it and being talked into, no, 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 don't feel bad, because here's all the reasons why, that's not it. The proof is this. Do you, have you turned from your guilt? All right, so this is the big one, guys. This is, this is the most practical one. Um, Jesus talked to, in, in the Beatitudes, okay, in, in Matthew chapter 5. There's a list of things called the Beatitudes. And, and the, the first thing he says is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what he said is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, whatever that is, for they're going to go to heaven. Okay? So this is, the, this is what we're talking about. How do I know I'm going to heaven? Because I'm right with God. Well, we have to kind of identify then what this poor in spirit thing is. And here's what it means. He's talking about being blessed if you're broken. Blessed are the broken. That word poor in spirit, that phrase means crippled in spirit. You're never going to be right with God if you come to Him with your resume saying, look how good I am. You're never going to be right with God rationalizing the guilt. The only way we're truly going to come to Christ and He live in us is if we come to Him broken. Because <coughs> you know what broken is. You know it. You know what, what it, you know what it is. You've been there. Where you're just... you're. You're done with trying to pretend like you can do it. You 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 are vanquished. It just it's you can't spiritually speaking. You can't even walk anymore. You see your weakness and your burden so much, and you're broken. You are absolutely a wreck because you know your wretchedness. Jesus says, when you come to me that way, then you go to hell. That's how you have to come. As, as much, and I know for, for younger people, it's kind of hard to imagine that. It's kind of hard to be there. But that's how we all have to come. That we're showing God when we come to Him, Lord, I desperately need You. I cannot do this on my own. I could try a million times, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail a million times. He also said this right after that. He said, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? Mourn over their sin. What breaks them is they know. They know that they bring to the table their sin. You know, God brings His power, His glory, His sacrifice, His love, His grace, His mercy. And what do we bring? A big old pile of our stinking sin. That's what we bring. Doesn't seem fair. You know, you ever have a party where somebody brings, you know, the, the moldy bread? Hey, Look what I, I brought. Yeah, I know you got the steaks and the shrimp. Here's some moldy bread. That's how we feel, spiritually speaking. Here. Here's my, my stinky feet, right? There it is. That's what I bring. <laughs> you know what? Stinky feet, in that sense, spiritually speaking, is an aroma that God loves. He <laughs> means <laughs> stinky. Yeah. As our brokenness over our sin is a smell that God cherishes. You say, how do I know I'm right with God? Let me ask you this. Did you come to Jesus broken, crippled? Did you say, Lord, I'm guilty, I'm full of sin, I'm a wretch, and I could do nothing about it. And now I've come, and I'm bowing, and I'm begging you, God, to rescue me. Save, <coughs> save me from my sin. 
Is that how you came to Christ? Are you trying to rationalize it? Are you trying to, you know, make it sound good to God? You can't fool the Creator. God knows what's behind your heart. God knows. God knows every skeleton in everybody's closet. The question is, did you come to Jesus broken and say, I need you. Rescue me, Lord. Rescue me from my sin, Jesus. That's why you died. That's why you bled. That's why you rose. That's why you're in heaven right now to hand out life to those who come broken. Because religion will tell you you don't have to do that. You can do it on your own. Good stack outweighs your bad. You're in. It doesn't work that way. What do you do with the guilt you have? That is, do you try to rationalize it? Do you try to let it be, uh, you know, what a religious thing, a spiritual thing? Or do you say, it broke me, God take it? All right, those are the first four, the biggies. Let me end with the last six. You ready? Let's slide home. Number five, genuine humility. Genuine humility. That's really what those Beatitudes are pointing out. And, and listen to the other, these other things that he said in that passage. Um, poor in spirit means broken, humble. Someone who mourns over their sin. Gentle, that means not power hungry. Hungers and thirsts for righteousness. So they, 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 they are hungry for God every day. Um, merciful, one who, who distributes forgiveness. These are all traits of humility. Look, if you know the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son said, um, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. I want to do with what I want to do. I don't want to do your will. I want to do my will. And he walked away, and he squandered it, and he had a, a, a come to a senses moment where he's eating pig slop and goes, what am I doing? Uh, you know, my father, even his servants, live better than this. So I know what I'll do. I'll go back to him. I'll turn back home. I'll turn back to God. That's repentance. That's what repentance means, turn. And that means it takes great humility. You know, it takes a lot of humility. It took a lot of humility for the prodigal son to say, I'm really just, this is bad. I can't believe what I did with my life. I'm going to turn back to my father. That's the prodigal son. And that's what we're all, we're all supposed to be prodigal people. Number six, devotion to God's glory. This is what salvation produces. Salvation, whatever we do, he says in, in, in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and Colossians 3, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we are literally consumed with the glory of God. Now, to be sure, hey fellas, hi. Okay. Um, to be sure, we fail in all of these things. And, I, and I, let me just say, let me just insert this right here. God is not calling us to perfection. Okay, so the answer is not, how do I know I'm a Christian? Because I'm perfect in my faith. <laughs> that is wrong answer. Okay. Um, God expects the ups and the downs. He, he knows that when it comes to loving people and it comes to being humble and it comes to giving Him glory, we are not going to bat a thousand. He knows that. But what I'm asking you to do is to look inside your heart and ask yourself, is God's reputation, is His name, is His gospel, is His kingdom, is it at the top of the list? That I may fail a lot, but when it's all said and done, God knows my heart and it's all about Him. Number seven, a desire to pray. I, I, I could have, well, let me just say, this is a New Testament thing. It is all over the New Testament. The speech, the, the, the teaching about being devoted to prayer, being alert in prayer, continually not stopping in prayer. Humble prayer, submissive prayer, believing prayer. This is, this is cover to cover, New Testament, cover to cover. In fact, it's all over the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, you see it talked about so much. Guys, here's the deal. If you're in Christ, one of the proofs that you're in Christ is that you want to talk to the person who is most important to you. And you cry out because you know this person, God, the Jesus, you know that when you talk to him, he hears you and he will act. So it's not just I get to communicate, I get to commune. 
I don't just get to talk, but I'm talking to somebody who hears me, who loves me supremely, and who can do something about it. That's the relationship we're supposed to have with God. And if you look in your heart and go, I don't have that relationship, well, then maybe you need to check your salvation. Maybe you need to ask the question, am I truly in Christ? A prayer isn't something that we're, it's like just a duty thing. D-U-T-Y. Okay? No. Prayer is this. I'm talking to the Lord. I'm bearing my soul. I'm bearing my heart. And here's the other one. Here's number eight. This is the other side of the communication. Hunger for God's word. So you have a desire to pray, number seven. Number eight is hunger for God's word. This communication, this communion is not just one way. It's not just us talking to him. Guess what? We long for God to talk to us. So, this is why we read the Bible. This is why we memorize those passages. This is why we have those devotionals on our phone. Why? Because we want to hear truth. We know the only source of truth is God. This is the 1 Peter 2.2 2 thing. Remember several weeks ago when we looked at this, where it says, like a newborn baby, crave the milk of the Word. What he was saying is, all babies have one thing. That's one thing on their mind. Mama's milk. He says, that's what the, the, the true Christian is all about. The one thing I crave is hearing from God and His Word. Number nine. Set apart from the world. Guys, this is a big one. Especially today. Because in Christian culture today, we've got a lot of, <coughs> I have one foot in and one foot out. I've got, I got Jesus and I got the world, and I could coexist in both of those realms and feel good about it. I don't know how many Christians, professing Christians, um, they go to church on Sundays, sing the hallelujahs and praises, and then their life, as soon as they step out of the foot of that building, is a mess, a sinful, wretched, fruitless mess. We cannot say, this is, this is first, uh, first John, right? This, this is his whole point. You can't say, I'm right with God, but I also love the world. You can't do it. It's a lie. And I have no problem lovingly telling people when they try to live that way, brother, sister, or if you are a brother or sister, listen, you say you love Jesus, but look at your life. Take apart the fruit. You remember what Jesus said. Um, if you abide in me, and I in you, you will, what? Bear much fruit. But, he began that whole analogy saying, look, a branch apart from the vine is going to burn up. I think he's talking about professing Christians who aren't abiding in the vine. They're ripped from the vine, and they're going to be on their own, and the burn up is typically an analogy for what? For hell. So, I, I take that to mean, look, there's going to be people who say they're Christians, but they're not abiding in the vine. In other words, they're not attached to Christ. They're not really in Christ. Now, you can say it all you want, but are you attached? And the only way to be attached, guys, is to repent from your sin and to turn to Him and say, Lord, I beg you for forgiveness. Forgive me, and now I live for you. He's my Savior, and He's my Lord. That's how we're attached. And then and only then, guys, are we bearing the fruit. So, set apart from the world. Um, John said in 1 John 2.15, Don't love the world, nor the things uh, that are in the world. If you love things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. He's not saying hate people. He's not saying hate people that are, are, are saved. He's saying, listen, this world system, this world opinion, this, this, this uh, stuff they're saying is true and you know it's not, don't buy into it. Don't give into that. Young people, you're, you're about to face, you are, you're facing it now, but you are facing uh, the demand to compromise. People are going to demand that you compromise your faith. Don't. And number ten, obedience. And I know that word has a strong connotation to it, negative connotation, but it's 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 right. Um, if you don't like obedience, then choose to put it this way: uh, it's the choice of the will to conform to and follow God. That's what obedience means. You're making a decision of the will to say, I choose the will of God. Now think about that. Um, 
how many times are we faced with, we know that God wants us to do this, really don't want to do this. Just don't want to do it. And yet, there we are, face to face. Are we going to surrender to His will, or are we going to live by our own will? We, none of us, bat a thousand men. I promise you that. But what God wants to see is that the course of our life, that we're getting more and more, you know, or, or I should say we're, we're, we're practicing that more and more. I would say that uh, here I am at 50. When I first came to Christ when I was 15, I think, God correct me on this, but I think that I am learning to give in and surrender to His will more than my own today, uh, a lot more than I was when I was 15. I will tell you, it's still nowhere near how I want it to be. Amen. Right? So, there are your proofs according to the Scriptures. Now, um, let me just close with this. <coughs> how, how do you live up to these lists, so to speak? And I, I, I want to I challenge you, I want to challenge everybody here. The wrong thing to do here is for us to rationalize. The wrong thing to do here is to uh, pretend. We need to be absolutely honest. We need to be just to bear our, our soul and say, you know what? I don't think that this guilt that I have, I truly don't think that I've done the right thing with it. I think I'm still trying to hold on to it and somehow let ministry and church take care of it. But I, I don't think I've ever turned from my sin and let my guilt, let Jesus have. Whatever the case, guys, whatever it is that you feel like, you, you look at this list and you go, this one, I put a star by this one. Maybe it's that you're already saved, but something today, the Holy Spirit is telling you, this one here needs to be shored up. I need you to focus and pay attention now. Maybe it's that you have been saying for two, five, ten, twenty years that you're a Christian, and today you've discovered, no, I'm not. The wrong thing to do is to say, oh well, the right thing to do is to say, I want to get on my knees. I want to ask for forgiveness. I want to turn from my sin and make Him Lord. I want you to turn to the person next to you. And I'd like you to just simply answer the question. What stands out on these lists to you today? <coughs> I'll give you three minutes. 